Welcome to the uh, September SJAA Imaging SIG meeting. And uh, tonight we got Rich Ozer, director of the GSSP. And Rich, you're going to tell us about uh, the future of star parties and <laughs> yeah, and all that. Well, so I, I got I got to tell you, I, this was, I, I appreciate you inviting me. And first of all, I, I uh, a big fan of SJAA. I always have been. Um, it's just a little bit too far for me to be a member of SJAA. So I'm, um, I'm up here in Oakland, and uh, so I'm at a very active with the East Bay Astronomical Society and the Mount Diablo Astronomical Society. I'm currently president of the East Bay Astronomical Society, and uh, we're, uh, you know, in a long-term, very long-term, almost 100 years now, uh, partnership with the Chabot Space and Science Center. Basically, our job is to keep them on the straight and narrow on the astronomy mission, and their job is to put up with us and give us uh, space to have our meetings and uh, and access to the facility. And somehow, this dysfunctional family continues to work after uh, after ten decades. And um, uh, I, I, I got to give a shameless plug: the the my background is the thirty six inch research reflector at the Chabot Space and Science Center. And every Saturday night, Gerald McKeegan and I do a live astrophotography uh, uh, program from nine to 10 o'clock using this telescope. Um, it's amazing what you can do if you have uh, bad data to show people, but it's been bad data gathered by a large telescope. And uh, we're able to do a live uh, camera uh, uh, session uh, for an hour, and especially with planetary nebula. Planetary nebula show up great using a simple Canon EOS camera and 36 inches of aperture. And, can, you put uh, the link? can you send the link to us and I'll put it. I on. will. I'll do that. I'll do that. And you could you could pass it along. We have a lot of fun. We, you know, we, we don't take ourselves too seriously. And uh, um, we have a regular uh, following and it's kept me sane for the last two years. We've been doing it every Saturday night, and I haven't missed a single Saturday. Um, when the weather's bad, we find something else to talk about, and we have fun anyway. So anyway, that's that's my shameless plug for the astronomy stuff. In real life, I have an IT company. Uh, no one can make a living with astronomy unless you've got your PhD in astronomy. So um, I, I, I do IT during the day. And uh, uh, I'm a, I am an astrophotographer these days. Um, I was a visual astronomer only for a long, long time and got into the astrophotography part of the hobby and found it very engaging. Um, I enjoy automating uh, telescopes and automating observatories. I use um, a C11 as my primary uh, instrument on a ancient CGE mount that's been hypertuned. I control the whole thing with my computer, of course, CCD camera, monochrome CCD with filter wheel, and uh, have fun and try to get my plate solving to work so I could do multiple night exposures. So uh, that's that's where I'm at in the hobby these days. Um, Hi asked me to talk about star parties, and my first reaction was uh, a deep depression. <laughs> when, when he asked me to do that, and I was thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to talk about star parties? I have been the grim reaper of star parties for two years now, convincing people to cancel their star parties, actually canceling some, some permanently, advising people not to go to star parties, because first and foremost, I have been very, very conservative about my impressions of the COVID pandemic. And I have epidemiologists in my family. I have family members who had gotten sick and um, I really believed in taking no chances. And um, the juxtaposition between our desire to get out under the stars with hundreds of people surrounding us and the realities of this pandemic have made it very difficult to try to organize in any kind of positive way uh, star party events, but I kind of feel like everybody's attitude is changing and including my own and maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel for those who have um, made responsible decisions and uh, we're going to have to sit down and make decisions about GSSP once again. So um, 
like like hi mentioned i am the director of the golden state star party i'm also an advisor to the oregon star party i used to be on the board of rtmc the riverside telescope makers conference um, which is no longer unfortunately and uh, several other smaller events that we hope to be having again in uh, you know in in the near future um, so i'm going to start my presentation i'm going to share here and make sure you guys are you able to see my screen? Yeah, it looks great. OK, very good. Let me click here. All right. Well, GSSP from Lassen Park to, well, west of Aden instead of east of Eden. And uh, uh, my presentation is called Anatomy of a Star Party. And I actually put this presentation together years ago, and I've updated it somewhat. Um, this was put together back when a lot of groups around the country were vying to become the biggest and best star party in the United States. And uh, the whole notion of these large star parties was uh, fairly new. And uh, I thought it would be fun to talk about the challenges of organizing these things and where the Golden State Star Party came from. And I'll tell you, SJAA plays a big role in the history of this event. And uh, I can't minimize that at all. It's uh, um, uh, a, a really fundamental role. But uh, we have to go back even further. Rich, to, I was just yes. curious. Uh, huh. Can we take, let's take a poll now that, you know, we're underway. And oh, yeah, yeah. I'd be very curious. People oh, uh, put do a hand raise. Yeah. Besides Rich and I who have been to the GSSP, who's on the call right now, unmute and just say hi. Okay. I, I guess that. So I guess that's it. Hello. All right. Hello. Wow. All right. We got one. Larry. Okay. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi, Larry. Hi. Hi there. Yeah, it's, it's uh, actually, I, I've been uh, meaning to try to get to the uh, Golden State Star Party for several years now. And, uh, you know, work has always gotten in the way. Um, but uh, I'll be retiring early next year and look forward to uh, joining folks once the Star Party restarts. All right, well, we'll talk about that. And I'm gonna to wanna to hear people's input um, because this is not only a catharsis for me to talk about this again, but it's also a focus group. You just guys just don't know it yet. Um, so anyway, the first star party, where did it come from? So I do a picture of Stonehenge there. I guess that qualifies, um, although they probably were uh, taking it a lot more seriously than we do. Um, and, uh, uh, but they probably, probably could have used the, some of the insurance we carry for the event. Uh, moving those heavy stones around seems a little dangerous to me. Uh, but uh, the guy who really gave us uh, the star party uh, uh, also gave us the tea party. So King George in England used to hold star party events. And uh, he was very interested in astronomy and mathematics. And uh, he uh used to have people hang lanterns where the stars would be if it was a cloudy night uh in the correct patterns that you would see in the sky and so he was kind of into it um i've been trying to enforce this dress code here that you see at star parties for many years and uh i've been uh, wholly unsuccessful at doing so now what about the oldest american star party well uh, that has to go to the Springfield telescope makers. Um, has anybody been to Stellafane? I'm curious, other than myself. Okay, well, Stellafane is a remarkable event. And uh, fortunately, it still happens every year. Uh, it, didn't, it, it did not happen in 2020, but they did hold it this year, I believe. And uh, it came out of uh, the Springfield Telescope Makers, and it started as a telescope making event and then grew into a much larger event uh, with astronomical observing and vendors and speakers. And it's kind of was the, uh, the muse for RTMC. RTMC decided to be the West Coast version of the, uh, of the Stellafane event. Um, I was lucky to go to Stellafane once, and it's in a really beautiful part of Vermont. I had never been to Vermont before, and I was just uh, amazed at how beautiful uh, Vermont is. In, in the summertime, it's obviously a lot easier to get around than in the wintertime, but I took the train up from uh, New York and uh, 
and uh, stayed a few miles away from Springfield and then rented a car to get to the event. Uh, I highly recommend it if you ever have a chance. Uh, it's got some really great historical instruments and it's a pretty good star party, even though their skies are eh, mediocre, right? And there's some pictures of Stellafane all the way back in 1926. And uh, they also had a formal dress code, I could see, you know, shirt and tie. Uh, uh, people are a little more laid back these days. So that brings us a little bit to modern times. And I have to mention TAC here. Uh, TAC, the astronomy con the connection, definitely has a relationship to SJAA, whether you know it or not. Um, we like to joke that TAC was the organization of observers whose clubs won't have them as members. And uh, it was the goal of TAC was to secure observing sites around the Bay Area, Montebello State Preserve, uh, uh, the, some of the parks uh, south of San Jose, um, in, you know, in the Morgan Hill area. Uh, uh, and uh, out in Livermore, uh, up in Lake Sonoma. There's several sites and TAC still exists as uh, a, a list serve and as a website. Uh, it used to be the main way before Facebook, social media, Zoom, all those things. Uh, it used to be the main way that observers in the Bay Area would stay in touch with one another, uh, declare their intent to go to some site, some dark site, and attract other people to show up uh, with them. And uh, I met a lot of interesting people on this list over the years, and many of whom uh, went on to help organize some of the events I'm gonna talk about. Um, so you can go to their website, observers.org. If you haven't been to observers.org, you should check it out. Um, and the main reason to check it out is to learn about some of the great observing sites uh, ringing the metropolitan uh, uh, Bay Area uh, that are only a couple hours away and worth visiting. So TAC founders, I don't know if you guys remember any of these people. But uh, Rick Newshafer, who went on to work for Orion Telescopes, um, Rich Navarrete, who lives here in Oakland, and I still see, in fact, I saw him last week, uh, Dean Leinbarger, Alan Nelms, uh, who passed away, uh, I guess he passed away in the 90s, uh, Ed Urbeck, uh, may, may, some of you may remember Crazy Ed Optical, and Ed Urbeck was the founder of Crazy Ed. Uh, John Kuklowitz, uh, myself, uh, Mark Wagner. Uh, um, and uh, this was a quote from Mark Wagner. There are only a handful that are original tacos left. Two departed for distant skies. One just departed and four of us are left here holding the bag. And that was in 2002. But of course, TAC 20 years later still exists. Not quite the same as it used to be. Not quite the same level of participation but still holds all these permits for great observing sites and allows uh, the community at large to use them without a lot of red tape. So without the sites, TAC would be nothing. And these are some that, were, that I'm listing. Uh, Montebello State Preserve. Uh, I don't know, have any of you been there? Yeah, okay, so Rich has been there and I can't see hands from the others. Uh, Montebello is above Palo Alto, way up near skyline practically. Uh, it gets above the fog. You get one of the darkest Western skies and darkest Southern skies that you can achieve in the uh, immediate Bay Area. And that's because in those two directions, there are no light nodes for when you're up at Montebello. The Eastern sky, forget about. It. It's, all, it's all light. But uh, it's a great way if you're, you know, if you miss the summer and you want to see summer stuff in the fall, uh, go to Montebello and uh, you'll still see them for a while. Um, Dinosaur Point is a great spot for fall observing. And uh, in, the, in the summer, it's just too windy. So nobody goes there. That's at the San Luis Reservoir. And uh, there are permit holders for that. And uh, once a month, uh, people tend to gather down there. Fremont Peak, I'm sure you've all heard about Fremont Peak Observatory, Fremont Peak Observatory Association. Um, 
there isn't really a lot of TAC traffic uh, related to Fremont Peak anymore, but there's still a relationship among some of the TAC members uh, uh, with the Fremont Peak Association. Uh, Henry Coe State Park, Coyote Lake, uh, Lake Sonoma are just some to uh, some of the sites that are actively uh, used. Um, that's a nice shot taken by Rogelio. Uh, I'm sure you all know who Rogelio Bernal Andreo is, uh, uh, one of our uh, favorite uh, astrophotographers from the Bay Area. Uh, and uh, that's where High and, uh, and myself uh, ran into one another. He lost his wife recently, a very sad uh, event. And uh, we were at her memorial and uh, um, and and that's how we reconnected. Uh, but that's a beautiful shot of Montebello by Rogelio. And uh, the lower shot kind of shows you the size of the parking lot and you know what the, what the site you know looks like uh, during the day. Um, this is what the Lake Sonoma looks like. Lake Sonoma is of all of the sites, it's probably the darkest because it's, it's two hours north of, of Oakland, roughly. And uh, there's not any major light domes near there. Santa Rosa, Healdsburg would be uh, the nearest light domes. Uh, so a lot of the uh, very serious deep sky observers go there. Uh, Steve Gottlieb is a regular there. Uh, I don't know if you guys know him. Um, and uh, a lot of other notable visual observers show up there. I have not, actually, I've never been there. I just know uh, about it. Uh, I've been meaning to go up there and I've never uh, had the opportunity really to, to drag my gear up there. You know, Rich, a lot of yeah. uh, people uh, in SJAA go south, I guess, yes. like Oakland. So like, you know, uh, Pinnacles. Are in yes. Pinnacles, it. Pinnacles. There's a lot of traffic about the Pinnacles on the tax site. People, uh, you know, making arrangements to use uh, the Pinnacles and tend to observe there. Um, that's a great spot. I've only been there a couple of times, but I love it. It's a really interesting place to observe. So, and you know, as you all know, aperture fever is proportional to dark sky fever, and um, the uh, there's always just been a desire to try to create. Uh, some way for those of us who are, uh, uh, you know, really invested in the hobby to uh, take advantage of dark skies. So, you know, what is a dark sky? And, you know, I'm sure you've all seen these Bortle scales and uh, with a uh, Bortle sc scale of, uh, of one being, of course, the best, uh, Gegenschein visible zodiacal light is annoyingly bright. Rising Milky Way confuses some into thinking it's dawn, uh, limiting magnitude 7.6 to 8.0 for people with exceptional vision, right? That's the holy grail. Uh, and in the other end of the spectrum, entire sky is grayish or brighter. Familiar constellations are missing stars. Fainter constellations are absent. Less than 20 stars visible over a 30 degree elevation in bright areas and limiting magnitude from three to four. That's describing my backyard. Pretty, pretty accurately. So these types of maps I we've found very useful for finding prospective sites for events, right? And so, you know, I've got to point out that, uh, whoops, I meant to go back here. Got to point out that Chabot's in a pretty terrible location. It's right there, uh, right on the border of the red and the white in Oakland. Uh, the, the only reason there's that red area is because the Oakland Hills are pretty much unpopulated. It's all parkland between there and Moraga and Walnut Creek. But uh, we get a pretty bright sky from the city of Oakland and San Francisco as well. Uh, you can see Griffith Observatory is even worse, <laughs> right? It's right in the middle of Los Angeles. It's got to be worse. Um, DelVal Reservoir, has anybody been there? All right, that's the Tri Valley. Okay, Rich has been there. It looks like you've gotten around, Rich, to all these various sites. It's, you know, I'm, you're like me. It's like, I wonder if that's any good. <laughs> I'll go there and see if it's any good. Um, the Tri Valley Stargazers in Livermore, they have two very nice sites. Um, one is the Del Val site, 
which is uh, on this map, and it's near Delval Reservoir. It used to also be a tax site, um, and I used to be the permit organizer for that uh, location. It was really nice for me. It was only about 40 minutes away. Um, and it was also one of the few locations in the Bay Area where you could reliably see Omega Centauri. And uh, there was actually, a, at the right time of the year, there was a notch in the mountains and you would just have to point your scope at the bottom of that notch and didn't even have to look very hard and there it was. So uh, that was always fun about the Del Val site. Um, but they also have a much darker site further south uh, behind um, Mount Hamilton. And uh, that's, that's uh, even a better location. It's well into the yellow or green area there. Uh, Montebello, as you can see, is in the brown area. And you're looking out over the uh, yellow when you're facing west, yellow and green. Fremont Peak is even better. Lake Sonoma, now you're starting to get into the dark blue, which is really good for an urban area. Stellophane's terrible, right? I mean, it's not terrible, but it's not great. For a big star party, it's, it's pretty, pretty bright. But that's true about the whole East Coast. You know, it's amazing. When you look at the map of the United States at night, and uh, at, uh, rather the, uh, the lights of the United States at night, um, and you see that map, the East Coast is so densely lit compared to the Western United States. So even though, even though they're out in rural Vermont, it's still really bright. So what makes a good star party? Well, it needs to be a day's driver less. We're not talking hours, it's really a day. I'm willing to go longer than that. I've done it, you know, I've done, I guess the longest I've gone for a star party has been a two-day affair. Um, and that's not counting Stellafane, because obviously I had to fly across the country for that. So that's the, that was atypical. But a uh, two-day affair is, is OK by me. Um, it needs to be a large enough space to accommodate many people. And you have no idea how difficult that is. Um, we have poured over maps to find places. Well, where can you have a flat area that's accessible that can accommodate hundreds of cars and campers and not have so many trees that it obstructs the view and has nearby services, campsites, where we can rent a ch shower truck and have some assurance that people will be able to feed themselves or be fed. Um, and you add up all the things you need in order to hold an event and you probably want to agree from the beginning that you don't want that event to be like uh, uh, the one that's held out in Black Rock Desert, uh, where you have to have you know trucks of it, material uh, brought in uh, and and uh, lots of logistics. You want it to be you know you want it to be reasonably easy to do, so you can actually enjoy doing the star party and still be able to organize something that is uh, fun and comfortable for people. And there are remarkably few locations in this huge state of ours that fit the bill. So RTMC was one of those places. And I said, put the RIP next to it. Uh, RTMC, finally, we had to close it down. It was not growing. It was shrinking dramatically. It was no longer able to be held on Memorial Day. It got moved to September, which caused even fewer people to show up. And if we had held it one more year, COVID would have killed it for good. And so we were able to gracefully exit with some money in the bank and uh, uh, you know, donate the rest of the balance to the Riverside Astronomical Society and say, hey, it was a fun ride you know, from the 70s onward. But you can see that it's not a bad location. It was, it's in the green zone, slightly better than Stellafane. And uh, RTMC was in Big Bear, in Big Bear Lake. So uh, what made that a doable star party was that it was at a place called Camp Oaks, which is a giant Boy Scout camp. And the, uh, excuse me, it was a YMCA camp. 
and the uh, the facilities were fantastic. There was a huge meeting hall for lectures. There was a full kitchen with cooks to cook meals. There were indoor uh, cabins for people who wanted to pay to sleep indoors. There was plenty of room for camping and there was not that many trees. So every, every you know, 20 feet was an area where you could set up telescopes, right? And there was a big observing field, there was an observatory um, and, uh, and it was near a sizable community. So it really was perfect. I, I very rarely have seen a place as good as Camp Oaks for holding that type of event. And it's sad that we can't do it anymore. Now, on uh, the other end of the spectrum, Glacier Point. Now, how many of you have done a uh, star party at Yosemite? Well, you know, all the major clubs in California get a weekend in Yosemite, usually go out to Glacier Point. And you can see that that is not in the absolute darkest skies, but it's pretty darn dark in Glacier Point. And uh, um, I enjoy going there very much. Texas Star Party is darker than Glacier Point, believe it or not. Uh, even though it's got those light domes nearby, one of which is from the prison, um, the uh, it's on the boundary of the absolute uh, darkest skies possible. Oregon Star Party, dark. That's out. Uh, that's in mid middle of Oregon, uh, along the uh, uh, in the John Day uh, area. Um, I'm, it's been a long day. I forget the name of the o o Ochoka Mountains. That's where it is. And uh, very dark, very dark sky event. Um, Lassen National Park, and we'll get back to Lassen in a minute. So the Lassen Star Party started in 1994 and went through 2001. And it was started by a group of people in the SJAA, along with a group of who were also members of TAC and brought along a lot of TAC members. And uh, this is a, a really interesting star party. People would camp uh, at Summit Lakes and Summit Lakes, if you can see my cursor, it's right here. And there were three different sites you could choose to set up your telescopes. You could go down to what was called the devastated area here, which was downhill from Summit Lakes. You could go to the big parking lot right underneath Lassen Peak, which was right here. Or you could go to what was called Bumpus Hell. And Bumpus Hell is this really neat place uh, with uh, hot springs. And there's a great hike from there that takes you to the uh, Lassen hot, Volcanic Hot Springs. And that was the highest elevation, was uh, Lassen Peak and Bumpus Hell. And uh, what you would do is you'd leave Summit Lakes before sunset, and you'd drive up, and set up your telescope, spend the night there, and then drive back uh, to your campsite. You couldn't stay set up at any of those three sites, but it was worth it because it was so dark. And then if you wanted to take a shower, you would drive all the way to uh, Manzanita Lake down here where the showers were, and there was food in the general area as well. So that was the last star party year after year. And you can see what a kind of setup looked like. This is in the devastated area. And, you know, it was all big dobs. There weren't a lot of astrophotographers back then. This photo was taken, I'd say, I want to say it was in like uh, uh, 2000 or so. And this is what bump as hell looked like back then. Doesn't look that different now, I guess. And uh, there are some of the usual suspects. Um, I want to point out a few people here. Uh, Randy Muller, maybe some of you remember him. Mark Wagner, he used to be your president. Um, geez, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, very nice person. I can't remember his name today. <laughs> and James Smith, and who is a dear friend of mine. And, uh, 
and they all wear those hats on a normal basis. Um, this guy here, Jim Stir, I'll get back to him in a minute. And there's uh, another picture of Randy. So there were lingering problems with the star party. I was not involved in organizing the star party, although I used to attend uh, when I got back into astronomy. Uh, I said, I got to find somebody who's organizing something that I can get out of the city and enjoy this with my daughter. Um, but you couldn't camp next to your equipment. You had to pack up every night and drive on a what I considered a treacherous road when you're tired. And I don't like that so much. Uh, there's limited space. There was limited camping. You had to drive all the way to Manzanita Lake to get services. And the meat bees, there are lots of those. And yeah, they were, they were relentless. And uh, I have a picture of one of my friends there in the lower right corner. So the next logical step for this group was to find something that was bigger, a bigger venue that was in the same general area. And we had something called the Shingletown, Shingletown Star Party, or SSP, and otherwise known as the Linear Star Party. And SSP was held east of Reading, about 40 minutes east of Reading, maybe 30, 40 minutes, on an abandoned runway that was a uh, fire, uh, uh, Cal Fire runway before it was abandoned. But because it had to handle those tankers, those water tankers, you could land a 747 on this runway. It was a big runway. And it was not being used for anything. The town was trying to raise money to build a community center. Jim Stir, who I pointed out earlier, and his wife, Margaret, uh, had the great idea of saying, let's have an event on the Shingletown runway and help raise money for the town. So they'll be welcoming to all these astronomers. We'll be able to take advantage of the fact that there's restaurants nearby and services nearby. And we'll invite all the astronomers from all over the state of California to come join us. And this was a wildly successful event for several years. I didn't attend the first year. I was a volunteer the second year and I was a co-director for the next three years of this event. And it was great fun. Um, but it was hot. And there was this red dust. The dirt on both sides of the runway was this volcanic red dust. And I remember having a car where 10 years later, that dust was still on the hubcaps. There was no way to get it off of anything. And some people who were really picky about their optics only came once. Other people, they would just like, they loved it. They'd come every year, they didn't care. They'd wallow in the red dust. We used to have come up with these crazy ways to keep the dust down. We even found a company that sprayed some product made out of uh, corn syrup and mixed with water and some other binding, organic binding, uh, uh, compound and they would spray the area on both sides of the runway we'd hire them for a couple grand and that would keep the dust down and it worked it was kind of it was really weird stuff and then there would be a water truck that would come by every once in a while to keep it you know watered down of course if you set up too close to the water truck you'd be doused so that, that was kind of you know the red dust was a real problem we, re we really hated that um, you could fry an egg on that runway, and we had to be really careful about, you know, people getting overheated. Um, and but it was a great event. It was it was really uh, unique. Um, so these are the things we did well, um, which was, you know, get people together, have fun, a lot of good, uh, stable ground for the scopes. Setting up on tarmac was kind of nice. Um, that's a nice 
shot of my dear friend Jim Turley who passed away uh, 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 last year. And uh, he was he was active with the SSJA at some point. Um, and these were these were some of the art that came out of the event. We used to have badges. Everybody would get a badge to indicate that they belonged at the event. And uh, uh, people with security, our, our volunteer security would check that the only people who came in were people who had, you know, who were supposed to be there. Uh, but we still had a public night where people could come from the community and look through the scopes. That was always a big, important component. Uh, things never to repeat. Karaoke and ATVs. It'll never happen in my watch ever again. <laughs> and there's a kind of a semi-aerial view of, uh, of what the Star Party looked like. It was a pretty good sized festival. And this is just at one end of the runway. You could imagine that, you know, it was really, you know, five times the size of this, just as densely packed. Clouds over Shasta, or uh, Lassen, rather. OK, but we had problems. We hit the maximum size. The runway was full, right? We couldn't get any more people in there. We had real problems with vendors. A lot of them were really flaky. And uh, that wasn't good. One, one year, in, uh, it, it, was, it was awful. We had a bad vendor food-wise, and uh, it, it, it made some people sick. And uh, that was a problem. We had the light dome from Redding, the red dust I mentioned, the heat I mentioned. And there were uncertainties about the runway's future. And don't let anybody ever tell you that astronomy doesn't come with politics. There were politics with the town. And the politics reached a point where we couldn't overcome the problems and we couldn't hold Sorry, can you guys hear me right now? Can you hear me? Okay, sorry, my, my, uh, my uh, headphones decided to turn off spontaneously. So uh, we had problems, political problems. I mean, it was all nice people, but we just couldn't agree about certain things. And it basically reached ahead after we had already begun planning the 2007 event. And at that point, we knew we had to do something different. Those of us from the Bay Area who had really been doing the brunt of the organizing said, we really want to be in control of the resources for this event. And we really want to kind of make our own future and not get caught up in small town politics if we could help it. And so from that, we decided to create a different event. Instead of SSP, Shingletown Star Party, we created GSSP. And that's how the name ended up. The acronym is directly from that. And uh, the, Shing the folks who were sticking by Shingletown and uh, were still trying to organize their event without any of the support from the Bay Area, they couldn't get their website going, which gave us an opportunity to uh, rent all of the campsites at Summit, Lake, at Summit Lake in Mount Lassen, put up a website, say we're moving the star party. We can't charge for you to camp, but we can charge for you to park. So through parking fees and t-shirt sales, we raised enough money to seed the future of our star party. It was just this like rapid coup <laughs> that we did in order to preserve uh, tax uh, presence in this large event in Northeast California and to kind of make our own future. And so we came up with that logo and that was our 2007 logo for the Golden State Star Party. And it was a great success. We did put give out badges that year. It was the last year we did badges. And it was the, we don't need no stinking badge, badge. And uh, this is what it looked like 
again, it was, looked a lot like the last in Star Party, except this time we figured out a way to monetize it for our, for our um, uh, purposes. And we set up a nonprofit, um, a 501c7. It's not a, it's not a charitable nonprofit. It's a membership organization for mutual benefit. And uh, so we became a, a, uh, a legal corporation. So we were able to get insurance and uh, actually have a, a real legal basis uh, behind our efforts. So the goals were to have a good star party, raise some cash and find a new permanent home for GSSP. We, we always knew that Lassen was a stepping stone. We did not want to have a permanent star party there year after year. So it was great. We had 180 attendees at Mount Lassen. We, re we raised three grand. And uh, PJ, we were mentioning uh, Kevin Medlock earlier. Uh, Kevin and Denny introduced us because at that point, Kevin and Denny were living in Fall River Mills. And they came up and they introduced us to the Albaugh family. Aaron Albaugh is the owner of the current site, or one of the owners of the current site uh, where we hold GSSP. And Kevin met him while he was bartending at Fall River Mills. He figured the best way to meet everybody in the area was to be a bartender. And he was right. So the Albaugh's came up and visited us. And then uh, later in the year, we went to their property to watch the Perseids, to check it out and see what it was like to camp and see what kind of sky we got. And that's what the site looks like before the star party moves in. This is their quote unquote private hunting grounds. And uh, the, uh, the Alba has owned 4,000 acres. They're cattle ranchers. And they also grow uh, a, 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 a type of perennial grass uh, for grass fed beef. And uh, this area is just available during the summer, it's, you know, there's not much going on on it. And they thought it would be a great place for us to have the star party. And they very, very graciously agreed to let us uh, make it our home for a long weekend every year. And you could see the nature of the unobstructed view here and why this is a great spot for astronomy. It's like being in a planetarium in the sense that you have the full horizon like this, north, south, east, and west. So where is it? Okay, let's see if I can get my mouse to work. All right, here's Redding, right? You all know where Redding is. So from Redding, you drive all the way this way through Bernie, and here's Fall River Mills. And you wind your way through uh, the town of MacArthur and Bieber until you get to Aiden. And that's where the property is. And so the nearest towns to the Star Party are Alturas, which there's not much to Alturas, uh, and Susanville. Susanville is probably the largest uh, population center in Lassen County because of the prison, right? And, uh, you know, Lassen Park is here. So basically, we, ba we just moved our star party a little bit east. And you can see that it is similar to Texas Star Party, more or less, or not quite as dark as the Oregon Star Party, but definitely in the dark part of the state. I'd say this is the darkest part of the state here and Modoc County are dark. Everywhere else, it's almost a loss at this point. So this is when we were there for the Perseids. And there's uh, Kevin Medlock and uh, uh, myself with one antler. And there's Wagner setting up his uh, daub in the background on the upper right. Ken Frank from the uh, president of the AANC or the organization formerly known as the AANC, uh, there, there with Kevin. 
And uh, that was the first time we used the property for astronomy. And this is Aiden, the, uh, uh, the Aiden Supply Market in Delhi. And here's a story for you. The current owners of the Aiden Supply Market in Delhi are former Star Party attendees, or I guess they'd be current as well because they'll still be there, um, who fell in love with the area so much that they moved out of San Jose, they moved up to Aiden, they bought a house right next to the Alba's property, and then they bought Aiden Supply. So uh, they are actually, that's, that's uh, uh, Chris and Inga Carey, and they're both on the board of directors of the GSSP, as well as uh, now owning uh, Aiden Supply. So several people have moved up to the area and uh, they became so enamored with uh, the beauty of this area and the, uh, and the people are so nice uh, that they thought they'd wanna you know, make, make their lives there. And we were welcomed, you know, people were very happy to have us. And uh, this is some of our, our, our signage. And in 2008, this is what welcomed people. And you can see some pictures of the family. Uh, in the upper left is yours truly with Barbara, who's the uh, matriarch of the family. She's one of my favorite people. Uh, Aaron, who I was talking about earlier, is in the middle of the uh, center frame and his brother, Andy. Uh, and uh, more of the family in the upper right. Uh, some of the kids. Uh, and uh, they're cooking for the star party. Because one of the other things I wanted to make sure of is that we had good food. And I remember the first year that we had the star party, they made steaks for 200 or 220. Aaron was out picking wild peas the day before that he knew where they grew on his property. And they made these salads with, you know, with wild peas that were grown on the on the ranch and uh, steaks from their uh, from their cattle ranch operation and uh, just real top quality stuff and we I always felt like you know if you if you have good food you can't have a bad event and it's it's one of my real philosophies uh, it's a toss up between the food and the shower truck those are two, both essential elements to uh, to a good star party. Um, and we had we had both of those things. Um, the organizers, there's Jane again. I mentioned Jane Smith earlier, and she's uh, 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 always been uh, uh, carrying a lot of the water for this event. And uh, uh, there is Inga on in that center photo. Photo. Uh, she's uh, the woman on the right. Uh, she's one of the owners of Aiden Supply now. Uh, Jeff Gordotowski, the upper right. Uh, and I believe that's uh, Debbie, Debbie Searles. Uh, Debbie Searles and Paul Allison are both uh, organizers of this event. Bill Port passed away, lower left corner. Uh, we miss him dearly. Uh, uh, that's uh, Susan Wicks. So Charlie and Susan are both uh, organizers of the event. These are some people in the lower section putting up the tents. Uh, Marsha Robinson on the lower right, wearing her Shingletown Star Party shirt. Um, here's some photos from the 2011 event, and you can see that sometimes we have pretty bad weather. In 2000, let me think about this, 2009, we experienced a deluge of rain the first night, and we had imagined we were thinking they're going to need tractors to pull the cars, campers out and everything. It's just going to be a sea of mud. And it turns out that the ground there is all volcanic and it all it just absorbed all the water. It just sucked it all out. And there wasn't a single stuck vehicle. Um, and we realized that we were we had really dodged a bullet because I was afraid it was going to look like Woodstock.
But on the second day, it cleared up. Uh, that's Charlie Wicks's uh, home-built uh, refractor in the top photo. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys remember Bruce Sayer. He used to build those uh, wonderful uh, binocular scopes. And that's, that's one of them in the lower right corner. And then somebody with a custom paint job on their car. It's all the constellations in the Northern Hemisphere. And this is what it kind of looks like when everybody's packed in and camping. Um, I took this photo just because I wanted to have a reminder of just how crazy the weather could get. So we were setting up, I don't remember what year it was. I think this is 2011. We were setting up on Tuesday and this weird looking cloud showed up. Just rest of the sky is blue, but just this one cloud showed up and it started to grow and it kept growing. And what happened was it turned into like this, almost a hurricane force wind all of a sudden. And it pulled up all of those tents you see in the background, including one of the hospitality tents. We had these big, heavy hospitality tents. And attached to one of those tents was Susan Wicks, who was holding on for dear life as she was carried 10 feet into the air by the, uh, by the uh, uh, wind generated by this cloud. And then it started to hail. It was 95 degrees and hailing. And it was just the weird, Susan was okay, thank goodness. It was just the, we get the weirdest weather there and you have to be prepared for everything um, because you never know what variation you're gonna get or combination. And here's some shots just from the uh, general area. Some more shots of the uh, star party and vicinity. Um, I'm going to try showing you a video clip here. I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I have to reshare with the right settings. Let's see if I can do this. Got to get the right. Let me get to my browser. Stand by. Sound, optimize for video. There we go. Can everybody see that? You'll have to speak. I, can, I don't see pictures of you at this point. I uh, see your OK, you're great. Full screen. All right. All right, I'm going to play. Can you go full screen? Uh, yeah.
That was from one of our talented uh, attendees. Hold on for a second. I got to make sure it doesn't start playing the next thing. Are you going to show the uh, drone video too? Hold on for a second. Uh, I have to stop my sound here. Ah, there is a drone video. It's pretty good, but um, um, I don't want to take up too much time. So I think I'm going to skip the drone video and uh, and mention um, a couple of other things. I had thought about doing that, but I don't want to. I don't want to overdo my time here. No problem. I can send out an email link. Yeah, yeah. It's a good. It's a good drone video. It, it's it's actually very enjoyable. So you should actually be back now and seeing my PowerPoint. And what I do want to do though is mention um, uh, some of the. If I'm in the, let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Uh, bear with me. Yeah. The other thing we like is uh, we've kind of created a strange uh, comic art out of GSSP. And Charlie Wicks is a very talented graphics designer. And uh, as a group, we would come up with some theme and he would execute it brilliantly and, uh, and come up with our t-shirts. So our very first event, we thought we'll do a play on Woodstock. Instead of a guitar, it'll be a telescope. And uh, uh, Four Nights of Peace and Starlight. And that was our first t-shirt. Uh, the second one was uh, uh, a shout out to the cattle ranching, roping in, good, in, roping in great skies at Frosty Acres Ranch with uh, Taurus the bull in the background. Uh, this is my favorite one. It's the one I'm wearing right now. Uh, and that's the play on the two th on uh, 2001, it, though, except it was two 2010, A Space Odyssey with the uh, surprised bull in the spacesuit. And the happy face is the, uh, is the logo for the ranch. That's what's on their brand for the, uh, for the cows. Uh, this was people's favorite in the end. And it's actually the hardest one to find because for some reason, the material for those shirts was not up to par. And uh, this was the uh, Mayan end of the world celebration. And you really have to look in deep detail on these rings and the various, uh, the various little graphics Charlie stuck in there. And there, some of them are hilarious. Um, you know, here was a homage to the rainstorm from the previous year. Um, gosh, I don't, I don't know, you know, lightning. Um, there's little telescopes in here. But anyway, it was, it was a play on the Mayan uh, uh, calendar. Um, this one uh, is the, uh, it's, I forgot who did this woodcut originally. And it was a play on that. Um, gosh, I don't remember. You guys, if you, if you could help me, if you remember who did this woodcut. Uh, it's from the uh, 1600s, I believe, maybe even earlier. But uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. This one, I think Denny Medlock had come up with the idea. This one was a little more mundane, but uh, here we go. Uh, this was uh, uh, the New Horizons mission was in 2015. So we decided to do an homage to New Horizons. Uh, Taurus the bull charting new territory. <laughs> this was my favorite one. This one shows the distorted eclipse path passing over Aden, California. Because everybody was at that point in time, it was like all over Facebook, all over social media was the uh, classic picture of the eclipse path. So I said, let's do one that's completely ridiculous and uh, uh, missed it by that much. Oregon Star Party, of course, it flew right over their uh, event. Uh, this was the Elon Musk Tesla in space. Uh, this was uh, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing with the methane tank. And then, of course, sadly, our last shirt, which was I stayed home for the 2020 Golden State Star Party. And uh, we did not have a 2021 shirt. You can't do this joke twice because it, it just wasn't funny anymore. 
But this is what we're missing. You know, the ability to gather together and, um, and have this kind of group. Uh, we don't know what it will look like next time. We don't know whether we will have hospitality tents. We don't know whether we can have group meals. We don't know um, whether we're going to want to, you know, say you have to be vaccinated to attend. Um, all of these things are really difficult questions. And we're not going to know the answer uh, until later on, we, you know, assuming we know the answer. Uh, coming up, CalSTAR 2021. I'm hoping to go to that. That's on uh, the 7th through 10th of uh, October. Uh, CalSTAR has always been another uh, event closely associated with SJAA. SJAA used to buy the insurance for this event uh, as a gift. Um, that's at Lake San Antonio in uh, Monterey County. Um, if you've never heard of it, uh, search for CalSTAR 2021. Uh, we don't know yet what the dates will be for GSSP 2022, but it will most likely be the July dates, uh, July new moon. Uh, chances are uh, Oregon Star Party will be held at the same time as GSSP this time, or at least within a week. Uh, to learn more, to follow, what we're deciding, uh, visit www.goldenstatestarparty.org or uh, find us on Facebook. We do have a Facebook page. And that's it for the slides. And now I gotta ask you some questions. And you guys can unmute if you want to, to ask me questions or, uh, but I, I've, got the, I've got the rhetorical question out there. Um, Given where we're where we are these days with COVID and uh, our you know general uncertainty, um, would you feel comfortable attending a star party at this point, or no? I know two years ago my answer was absolutely not. One year ago I was thinking that maybe I would, but now we better not, and uh, you know. Other star parties came to similar conclusions. Texas Star Party couldn't get insurance last year uh, or last time. Uh, Oregon Star Party got burned out. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't hold the event because the Forest Service said, no events. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Can't do it. GSSP wasn't held because we felt that the state was still much, too much in, in a lockdown mode and we were going to be irresponsible to hold it, Lassen County is the least vaccinated county in California. It's got a 28% vaccination rate. And uh, so I wasn't comfortable and neither were the other people on the committee. So um, I feel like next year, our discomfort will have faded. I don't know whether that will be due to any changes in facts on the ground or not. Uh, it's just that we're, you know, people are starting to do what they want to do regardless of circumstances. So I don't know. I don't know. And uh, I, 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 although I feel better about the idea of, of holding a star party, um, well, we have attendees. Would, would you folks be open to the idea of one? I mean, we're starting now. I think astrophotography is the future of star parties. Everybody's doing astrophotography now in some degree. It's not just, it used to be a purist visual event and uh, that has changed. Um, and I, uh, I, I encourage astrophotographers to, uh, uh, to uh, attend star party to get that additional signal to noise ratio. And uh, the, there's nothing like a dark sky to make your life easier uh, in, in post-processing. And uh, the, the, you're able to go a lot deeper when you're in dark skies. Um, so that's a big part of our event. I'd say half our attendees were, were doing some sort of astrophotography by the time uh, COVID rolled around. Um, so we wanna hold the event, but um, we also wanna know if people are open to the idea so any thoughts? 
Uh, I have some uh, uh, analogy or a uh, parallel instance of what's going on. If you look at Hawaii uh, with the tourism that is occurring there, and after all, it's astrophotographers and, and uh, whatnot, essentially we're tourists. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the situation, and it's all very much in flux, is that um, situation in Hawaii is, is that it appears that the uh, Lieutenant Governor of, of Hawaii has come out and said that tur the tourists themselves, because many of them come over from California and or whatever, um, they are not, they are not the major spreaders of COVID at this point in time. What is happening is that a fair percentage of the COVID that is being spread is by Hawaiians that are returning to Hawaii, that's one. And two, all the locals that have been in total isolation are now ripe for fast spread within their social groups, wherever they may be. Many of them are not, uh, part of the tourism industry. And so I would suggest that that's probably going to be uh, happening um, with, uh, let us say the rural counties, if you will. I spend most of my time in Tuolumne County and that appears to uh, be kind of what's happening there as, as people try to go to work back in the tourists. Uh, industries, um, they are uh, a lot of it is being infections among their group and not necessarily caught from tourists. Uh, so I suspect that that is probably a trend that is going to uh, continue in the, uh, the rural counties. And dare I say, a Trump land. Yeah, no, I mean, it's important. Um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that because it gives me another way to look at it. Um, I think looking at it in the uh, context of tourism is probably really valuable because it allows me, it certainly allows me other Google search terms <laughs> to, uh, to uh, uh, see how different communities have been dealing with the uh, tourism or lack thereof in the um, in in the presence of COVID, um, I have to think about uh, things like, all right, we've got two three hundred people on the field. Do we require vaccination? Are we going to police that, or are we just going to strongly suggest it? I don't want to be policing things. It's not. I, it's it's not we're not good at it. I'm not good at that, and I don't think I want to create that uh, atmosphere. But I would probably put a note up saying we strongly suggest you attend this only if you've been vaccinated. Something like that. Um, we also, you know, we have a shower truck, right? So you have hundreds of people sharing. I mean, the showers are clean constantly by the, they're staffed the entire time. They're not just sitting there um, and they're cleaned uh, very frequently, if not after every shower, um, assuming we can get that vendor because that vendor had closed down, not doing anything at all because of COVID. Um, assuming that we can get that uh, vendor again, um, you know, that's another, people are gonna look at that and they're gonna say, oh, you know, I don't know who's been taking a shower. I mean, we're, we've all forgotten how to be social, you know, and that's, that's the reality of it. And uh, so there's that. And we have, um, you know, and we, we have 16, 24 porta johns, right? So there's that. Um, probably it might be premature to do shared meals just because of people being in proximity. And so people will have to, you know, fend for themselves, either go to the restaurants or, or cook in their campsites. So uh, those are all of the different issues that I'm juggling. Um, I don't want to turn it into something that's not fun anymore, because then why would anybody want to come? Yeah. Right. By the way, Nick had a comment. Did you want to speak up? Yeah, go ahead, Nick, please. Well, I'll give him a few seconds to. Yeah, you're, you're muted. 
Well, Nick, while I... we're waiting for Nick, can I make a comment? Please, please, please. Diane. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I went to um, the um, the CalStar last year, and um, was I'm very concerned because I have a daughter that has special needs, and so I kind of police myself. Yes. Um, I basically stayed probably about 50 yards away from everybody else. Um, brought my own porta potty. Um, and, you know, so I think, uh, I think some of it also falls on us because I can't, I can't depend upon the world to be, to follow all the, um, the advice. Yeah. Uh, and so I, we went to Montana this year so that we could, so, so that we could see Perseids. We stayed at a cabin that was away from everybody else. Um, and so I police myself and I think that, um, I was actually planning to go to the golden state party this year because, um, because I felt like I could still do the same thing there. Do you think it would be helpful if we did something like, you know, I like that attitude. I, I'm with you. I, I really appreciate yeah, and your I comment. Not everybody else yeah. Will feel that way. yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I think it's realistic and the, and maybe what, we can do to help is to put the cap on the event at a lower number so sure. it is easier for people to spread out that sure. may demand that we raise the price a bit and i would pay more uh, but um i think that maybe for, for us to be responsible um we need to create the environment that makes it easy for other people to act responsibly right i agree I agree. I mean, I would probably wear my, I, I would probably wear my mask around people. Mm -hmm. um, um, I would um, social distance. Um, and I said, and it's, it's really basically I'm protecting myself. And even though I'm vaccinated, it doesn't, it's not fully protective at this point with the new right. variant. Right. And we don't know what the next variant might be. Are you going to go to CalSTAR this year? Yes. All right. Maybe I'll see you there. Yeah, well, I might still be a ways away from everybody, but you can go out and see me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Try to find me or vice versa. I appreciate I'll look it. for you. Yeah. Yeah, um, I wanted to, to say that um, last summer, um, actually, I was really surprised. Um, <clears throat> during actually the lockdowns, uh, we went to Pinnacles one weekend. And um, surprisingly, both parkings on the west were full with uh, astronomers. Hmm. Um, and, um, what I saw that is that, um, people were following the safety. Also people were with masks. Nobody was actually looking through the other telescopes. Hmm. Um, so they were actually following the safety. I don't know whether it was organized or not, but people were following the safety, um, uh, rules and the message is, if there is a star party somewhere, people will come, right? Um, because even during the pandemic, it was less known that people were gathering for astronomy events. Even though it was not very kind of publicly known, but mm -hmm. there were events. <laughs> somewhere, yeah, right? I know um, there were. Yeah. Yeah, there were events. And I saw a few of them. Um, so yeah, so if if there is a party, a star party somewhere, and if there is some sort of organization, people will come because they they look for it, um, and there is a desire to come, right? So that's the message. <laughs> well, it is will be difficult, yeah, because we have to follow all the rules, the uh, hygiene, and uh, all this stuff. But uh, there is a there are actually people who come, who come, right? So if they know. There's a star part somewhere. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. I guess I'll give you my point of view. Uh, so I, I just been to one, which is, you know, 19 GSSP 19, my first and last, unfortunately, so until now. And, uh, you know, it's a long drive. So, um, I mean, it's not like going to Oregon, but it, it was like six hours or something like that. Or I, I may have be off by a half hour. Yeah, you're not that far off. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, and I can go to Pinnacles for two hours. Now, I loved GSSP and I would go back and, and if things were normal. But the attraction to me was, you know, 
talking to a million people about their telescopes. I mean, there were telescopes everywhere. It was going to a telescope convention. And, you know, I just spent my time walking around. I didn't know anybody there. I went on my own, you know, pitched my tent, had a great time, but I didn't go with friends and I didn't bump into anybody I knew. But I had a great time visiting people, talking to people. People were so good, so friendly and seeing all the stuff. If you took that, and, and by the way, the food and the showers were great too. And the charging stations and all that, that good stuff, all the infrastructure that you provided. But, you know, if I didn't have the, you know, if I had to really cut back on the people and the food. It's, and, hard, it's hard to imagine, right? Yeah, if I yeah. did that, then I don't know that I would be motivated to go because, you know, yeah, Pinnacles isn't the same, but it's pretty good and it's two hours. And if I don't have people anyway, I mean, the draw to me was the people. So I, I have to be, a, I have to be a bit of a student of social behavior. I think what I'm going to be doing is, um, you know, I'm going to be watching how people interact at CalSTAR. Um, I have friends who are going to Okie Techs, which is, uh, I wanted to go to that actually. That's, that's a big star party, very similar to GSSP in Oklahoma, in the Oklahoma panhandle. And um, I'm, I'm gonna be interested to know how successful that event is. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, it's in, in Oklahoma, so that's a, another low vax part of the country, yeah. but um, nonetheless, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see whether Texas can put on an event and where uh, my friends at Oregon are. And I think that, you know, I've got to watch what other people are doing. Um, but, um, you know, I'm going to end up respecting, you know, what the majority of our uh, organizing committee, you know, wants to do. And I that's, want, yeah. that'll be the that'll be what ultimately, you know. And I think when you're looking at too, you have to look at lo locality because Texas is going to be way different than Oregon. Yes. Yes, it is. I just wanted to break, uh, it's a little off topic, but uh, my, my GSSP story from 19 was my first night. Like I say, never had been there uh, to a star party. And I was, you know, following all the rules and I didn't want to have a lot of light, and, you know, <laughs> all that stuff, right? And I was, you know, in the boonies in your uh, image, you know, the far out imaging session in the boonies. Oh yeah, and, uh, you're out in the Oort cloud. Or cloud. So I was far away. I mean, there were a lot of people near me, but it was far <laughs> from the food. Tree. You know, not that far, right? But anyway, so I go there. It's real dark. And I take a walk at night. You know, I set up my telescope and it's imaging, and I don't need to be hanging out with it. It's going just fine. So I start taking a walk and I walk around. Anyway, I get totally lost in the dark. I mean, I'm in the star party and there are people all around, but I have no. And idea. you don't know where you are. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, that, that's know. happened to me. <laughs> don't feel course, so bad i don't want to take out my bright flashlight and start pointing at everything no it's like i've caught myself saying i know every inch of this field and i have absolutely no idea where i am right now right i have to ask people <laughs> okay where are we you know if i walk, which way do i walk to the org cloud you know <laughs> so, and uh yeah anyway it was that was my funny experience yep yep all right well thank you for those comments um I don't know, you guys have any questions or any other thoughts? And uh, if not, uh, I, I do want to mention one other thing. We did have the opportunity. Um, SJAA uh, helped sponsor a really good film called Saving the Dark. I don't know if you guys have all had a chance to see that. Um, but uh, several of us from GSSP were uh, 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 narrating parts of that movie. And they had some really great scenes in the beginning of the film from GSSP. Um, so it, 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 I can now say we have GSSP, the motion picture, yeah. uh, but uh, it's a really good film. If you wanna see uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, other characters who are involved in, the, uh, in, in that project, uh, as well as learn some really great stuff about light pollution. Um, I want to put a plug in for it because your club was instrumental in that uh, getting uh, 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 brought to fruition. So, all right. That's well, it, I guess. I guess that's it. Well, Rich, thanks very much. That was a, a really fun presentation. I really enjoyed it. Hope everybody Good. did too.
All right. Well, uh, I, I hope I see some of you join us at the Chabot uh, uh, Saturday night uh, thing that we do. If you're yes, bored anyway. on Saturday, come uh, tune in and see us make asses of ourselves for an hour. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, Rich, and thanks everybody else. And I guess that's the end of our uh, of tonight's meeting. All right. Nice to meet everyone. Take care.